Hello, everyone, and welcome to our seventh Faulty Shah learning series. Um, as you know, this series is all about trying to help everyone working in fields related to using faults in seismic hazard assessment to learn more about what each other do and actually make sure that when we go to conferences and when we read papers, we, we have a good understanding of the fundamentals behind it, as well as being able to delve into the latest research. So today I'm absolutely delighted to um, have John Douglas speaking for us. He is a senior lecturer um, at the Center for Intelligent Infrastructure uh, with the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow in the UK. Um, he has many accolades to his name, including an H index of 43 and over 8,000 citations, according to Google Scholar. So I think we really are learning from someone who understands ground motion models um, to a level that they can actually explain it to us all and make sure we understand them fully. So John is going to talk to us today about estimating earthquake ground motions, background methods and challenges. If you do have any points of clarification through the talk, please do feel free to ask um, and then we will have time at the end for any sort of deeper level of discussion or questions which are more open and require a bit more time. Um, so at this point, um, I welcome you, John, thank you again. We really appreciate you coming to speak to us today and look forward to your talk. Okay, thanks very much, Joanna. So um, first of all, I just want to thank um, the for the invitation and um, hope you find this of value. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, can you just confirm that you can see that okay? Yes, it all looks yeah. great. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'm, I'm, as I, um, as was said, I'm going to talk today about estimating earthquake ground motions. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure of the level of everybody um, in this topic. So I thought I'd start off with some background and then the methods and then the sort of future challenges which we're trying to address in this field. Okay, so as you're probably all aware, seismic hazard assessments seeking to determine the nature and intensity of ground motions that could be generated at a particular site in a future earthquake. So generally we separate this into two parts. So one of them is what we can de define as event parameters. So this is, for example, what's the probability of a given earthquake occurring on a given fault? And then the second part is what's the expected ground motion at a site, assuming the occurrence of this earthquake. So the results of seismic hazard assessments, there's sort of two main results outputs. If we start on the right hand side, um, so this is what's called response vectra. Um, so I'm going to go into detail on what these are, but this basically a measure of the earthquake shaking, um, which could affect structures of different natural periods and damping. So these are one of the key outputs of any seismic hazard assessment. You could, um, for very detailed seismic hazard assessment, actually assess the time history of the earthquake shaking at the site, um, which could be shown on the left-hand side. So this is a, a measure of the, say, the acceleration with respect to time. Um, you could, one of the key parameters that um, most people um, know about is what's called peak ground acceleration, which is simply the measure of the maximum acceleration which occurred during the earthquake at the site. So what we'd normally do in seismic hazard assessment, particularly in probabilistic seismic hazard assessment, is we determine the annual frequency of exceedance of a given ground motion level, so for example, say 0.1 G PGA, and we decompose that into two parts. So that's um, the annual rate of earthquakes might multiply by the probability that shaking will exceed that um, a certain ground motion level. Um, so, um, so the outputs of seismic hazard assessment are a key input to earthquake engineering. Um, so the, the design and assessment of structures under earthquake loads. So, um, so this is the main um, outline of seismic hazard assessment. And so today I'm gonna to be talking about um, how to assess what the expected ground motion at a site is, um, assuming the occurrence of a particular earthquake. So if we now look, um, rather than in words, look at actually what this means in um, numbers or in, in an equation form. Um, so this is just, um, don't get frightened by the equation. I'm sure you all know it anyway. 
Um, we're assessing the annual frequency of exceedance of uh, ground motion level. Um, and we can decompose this into how many earthquakes there are in a source zone above a minimum magnitude. So often this is maybe four or five in a, in a normal assessment. Um, we also have the probability of the earthquake of a certain magnitude occurs. Um, so this is often using, for example, the Gutenberg-Richter relationship or maybe something more sophisticated. But also the probability of that earthquake occurring at a certain distance from the site. And then the final piece, um, what's the occurrence of the ground, what's the probability of the ground motion level exceeding a certain threshold given the occurrence of this earthquake? So yet again, this is the part I'm going to be talking about today, this how to assess these probabilities. Um, so those of you who are interested, I did develop a few years ago a, an Excel version of a simple PSHA showing these different aspects, which you can, you can download if you're interested. Um, so just to show the importance of GMPEs, so the GMPEs are ground motion prediction equations, which are the, the way we generally assess these probabilities. Um, we often, within seismic hazard assessment, we, um, we look at the sensitivity of the various inputs um, on the total hazard. So this is sometimes defined in terms of um, what are called tornado plots. So this is an example which I took from a, from a um, series of papers where they addressed uh, the, the results from a hypothetical European site. So this is sort of maybe Fra Southern France, um, Italy, where they showed the total hazard, um, the uncertainties in the total hazard. And then they showed the uncertainties being contributed to various aspects of the, the, the hazard assessment. So we've got the catalogues, um, the, the zonation, the Mmax, um, the focal depth, etc. And what you can see from this is that GMPEs, so these ground motion prediction equations, uh, are often the largest, um, contribute the largest uncertainty to the final results. So this is sort of indicates how important they are for seismic hazard assessment. So this is a general result, and this is often seen in any seismic hazard assessment. So now I'm gonna go a bit into depth about the derivation of these ground motion prediction equations. So first of all, I wanna just talk about the input data. So um, the input data to these models are um, strong motion data. So until the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, almost all um, earthquakes recorded in the near field. So this is within, say, a couple of hundred kilometers of a large earthquake, magnitude um, five and above, were recorded on analog strong motion instruments. So one of the most common, uh, one of the most well known of these is what was called Kinemetrics SMA1. So you can see a picture of it here, not a very good um, reproduction of the picture. Um, so these recorded on film um, and there was a, um, a sensor within the instrument which recorded on film. The, pro the film then had to be developed, um, digitized, and then that digitized record used in the, in the analysis. So obviously this procedure introduced some noise. There was quite a lot of time taken between the digitization, um, the, the process and the digitization before the record could be used. So in the early 1990s and basically now all of strong motion data are recorded on it, digital instruments. So this is an example here. Um, and they, they record directly onto um, in digital format. So either a, a sort of hard drive or perhaps via the internet directly. Um, so that means that you don't have these um, processing steps that are, that are needed previously. So this is obviously reduces significantly the amount of noise and the time taken. Um, so strong motion data are now available quite in quite a lot of different places online. So here's some examples from various um, data sources. So you have, for example, the ESM um, database, which is a very extensive European database. Um, and um, ones from Japan, the KNET, KICNET databases, et cetera. 
Um, so one thing that's happening um, in the last decade or so is there been increasing use of broadband data. So not just data from strong motion instruments themselves, which record in acceleration, but broadband, which generally records in, records in velocity and then has to be translated in acceleration and what are called MEM sensors. So these are low cost instruments which um, have allowed us to increase the density of strong motion networks. So just to give an example of the availability of strong motion data, so this is a figure taken from a, um, a, a Californian project called the NGA West 2 database, um, where they collected data mainly from California, but also some um, data from Europe, um, Japan, Taiwan, et cetera. And as you can see, each of these dots is a strong motion record. Um, as you can see, there's thousands of records now available. Um, including all the way up to magnitude um, 7.8 or so, and very close to the fault. So the distance here is the distance to the, the fault. And because of the fact we've changed from analog to digital instruments, the number of records available sort of doubles every four years or so. Um, so most data is now um, is recorded in um, California, Japan, Mediterranean region. Um, but there are networks elsewhere as well. But it's very um, um, heterogeneous, the networks around the world. It's, um, they're, not, um, they're not equally distributed, the instruments. So one of the things you can see from this um, plot is that the available data from the largest magnitudes and the very closest distance, so the, the part here roughly in the green triangle, is quite sparse um, because earthquakes don't occur that often. Um, large earthquakes don't occur that often, and hence we don't we have to wait quite a long time to record the data. Also, we don't know where the earthquakes are going to occur, so there's a, a lack of very near source data. Um, so when we're um, rather than try to estimate the, the complete time history of um, a future earthquake, we often just try to estimate some key parameters. So um, these were strong motion parameters um, or intensity measures as they're often called these days. So these try to capture sort of critical characteristics in terms of their amplitude, their frequency content, the duration, energy content, et cetera. So I've already mentioned a few of these. So peak ground acceleration, PGA, um, response spectra acceleration, um, spect um, et cetera. There's also a move in the last um, decade or so to, to estimating the Fourier amplitude, um, and then combine that with the duration to get a better estimate of the, the strong shaking um, for engineering purposes. I'm not going to get into those. I'm going to mainly concentrate on the response spectra and peak ground acceleration um, prediction equations. So just to indicate that peak ground acceleration, so PGA isn't a very good measure to fully characterize um, strong ground motions. I'm showing this figure from the PhD thesis of Julian Bomber. Um, where he had quite a nice example showing four strong motion records from four different earthquakes. All of them had the same peak ground acceleration, um, but you can see that they look completely different. There's the Mexico City record with very long period shaking and some of the other ones with very short duration, etc. So knowing the PGA doesn't really tell you a great deal about how strong the shaking was and how um, that would influence structures and undergo um, suffering that shaking. So we often use what's called response spectra in um, earthquake engineering. So um, this is a measure of the, um, how the shaking would affect a single degree of freedom system of a certain um, natural frequency and a certain damping. So if we start on the left-hand side of this um, diagram, we can see um, various um, uh, 
various uh, infrastructure. So at the bottom, we've got um, pipe work um, components which react to the shaking at a very high frequency or short period. So basically, they just feel the actual strong shaking directly. They don't really um, uh, resonate particularly. Then we have the buildings um, with a longer period. Um, and then we all, all the way up to say suspension bridges with very long natural periods. So these feel the, the shaking in different ways. So what we do is we simplify them in terms of their natural frequency and their damping. We input the record at the bottom of that system, and then we record say the maximum displacement that that system underwent or the, um, the maximum um, acceleration that it, it fell. And then if you plot those um, maximum displacements or um, accelerations with respect to period, we get a plot um, like shown on the right-hand side where we have period on the x-axis and the displacement on the y-axis. Um, so that allows us to sort of characterize the shaking in terms of its um, period uh, frequency content. Um, so now I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the history of ground motion prediction. So strong um, motion records were recorded from the 1930s onwards. So in those days, people just used what was called the representative accelerogram approach. So they just basically used a handful of different strong motion records, assuming future earthquakes would look like these past earthquakes. Um, in the 1960s, what are called here empirical ground motion models, so these are GMPEs, um, were starting to be developed, um, and they're still the basis of almost all hazard assessments um, uh, in, in recent times. Um, over time, these models have become more sophisticated, so we're, we're modeling a, more of the detail of the scenario that um, we're interested in. Um, so I'm going to go on to some of the, the key inputs to these models in the coming slides. The other thing to mention here is that um, in the late 70s, early 80s, what's called physics-based stochastic method was, it was developed. Um, and this is commonly used in stable areas where we don't have very much strong motion data. And it's more based on seismological input parameters such as stress drop, um, Q models, et cetera. So they're used um, in stable areas quite a lot, but um, empirical ground motion models are still one of the key parameters, key, key inputs to hazard assessments in active areas. In recent um, decades, there's been a move towards simulation, so finite difference, spectral elements, et cetera, um, and they allow a much more detailed est um, estimate of the, straight, uh, the strong ground shaking, um, and I'm gonna mention those at the end of the talk. So now we're just on to the ground motion questions, um, just to show you an example. So this is one from, well, 16 years ago that I helped develop this model, just as an example. Um, and <clears throat> so this is just, all it is, is basically a closed form equation with, for example, um, heat ground acceleration on the left-hand side um, and inputs of say moment magnitude distance from the um, source to the site. Um, so I'm going to talk what join a board distance means in this context in a minute. And then what we do is we use this strong motion um, database um, and we do a, a, a simply a curve fitting. We use our strong motion database, fit the coefficient, three coefficients in this equation to the database and we come up with a ground motion prediction equation. And then we allow, it allows us to make predictions such as this. So for different magnitudes and different distances, we can get an estimate of the median um, shaking in a future earthquake for, of that, with those characteristics. Um, I forgot to mention just a bit of terminology. So until really the year, early 2000s, uh, such equations we use call, commonly called attenuation relations. And then there was a move to say that they're actually more, um, more general term is GMPEs or GUMPEs as some people call them. Um, and then recently people have started referring to them as ground motion models to be more gen uh, general um, because we don't always have to express them as equations. We could actually have a table of predictions for different magnitude distances. 
Um, they don't actually have to be an equation. Um, okay, so now we're going to get on to a bit more um, in detail of GMPEs. So first of all, just to show that um, as GMPEs um, have been developed over the last decades, we now have um, about 600 GMPEs in the literature that have been published, 20, 25 models published every year. Um, so if you're interested in looking at the models that are available, you can have a look at my website, which is referred to at the bottom, um, and you can get the sort of characteristics of the model. So obviously with this number of models, we need to need to, a way of choosing which ones to use. So I'm gonna come onto that in a, in a minute. But first of all, I'm just going to talk about the inputs to these GMPEs. Um, so if we um, consider earthquake um, shaking composed of three parts, so first of all, we have the earthquake source. So in GMPEs, these are um, invariably characterized by the magnitude. So in recent decades, we've started using the moment magnitude almost exclusively. We also have sometimes include the mechanism, so the faulting mechanism, often called style of faulting um, in such models, sometimes focal depth, sometimes whether it's an aftershock or a main shock, etc. Then the path um, characteristics are defined in terms of the distance from the source to the site. Um, some models can consider whether the site is on the hanging wall or the foot wall of the fault. Um, and some of them also have terms to handle the fact that they earthquakes occurring in different regions. Um, and then the site itself is characterized in terms of its um, the, the, the top 10, 15, maybe 30 meters of soil um, in terms of its stiffness. And then also make perhaps more the sediment depth as well, the depth of the bedrock. So now we're getting on to faulting mechanisms. So um, generally in ground motion prediction equations, we, we consider earthquakes to either be strike slip, reverse or normal. Um, and there's a number of attempts to include this effect within ground motion prediction equations um, over the last 40 years. Um, but there's still quite a lot of uncertainty in the size of how important this factor is actually. Um, so if we look at the ratio, so this is now various ground motion prediction equations. So I've evaluated them for the same magnitude distance and I've evaluated them for assuming it's reverse or assuming it's strike slip and then just done the ratio between the two on the left-hand side. You can see that on average, it seems that there's some evidence for slightly higher motions in um, reverse faulting earthquakes, perhaps a factor of um, 1.1, 1.2, say 10, 20% higher, um, but it's not a very consistent effect. Looking at the difference now between normal and strike slip, which is on the right hand side, there's perhaps some evidence for slightly lower um, shaking in normal faulting earthquakes than strike slip. Um, but again, there's considerable uncertainty in this. Um, so the problem is it's not clear whether this is an effect of mechanism or it's actually a regional effect because we have generally, for example, reverse faulting earthquakes occurring in one region and the normal faulting in another region. Is it actually some other regional effect or is it, is it actually mechanism itself? It's quite difficult to distinguish. Um, and the next parameter, so I'm just going to talk about the path parameter, so distance now. So as we all know, um, an earthquake occurs along a, um, a fault, so this is not a point source. But in um, the original models, most of them used epicentral distance or hypercentral distance, so D1 or D3 and uh, D2 in this diagram. Um, but in the last, well, 40, 30, 40 years, there's been a the move towards using an actually distance to the fault itself. So either we project it onto the surface, the fault onto the surface, and just measure the distance horizontally. So this is what's called in this um, diagram D5. So this is the joint of bore distance. 
or we actually account for the depth of the fault. So this is what's called D4 in this figure, which is rupture distance. So these are much better measures of the distance when we, we're talking about large earthquakes, magnitudes um, six and above. Um, so that's a, so pretty much a, a de facto standard. We're using either of those two measures. Um, and then the final in, um, main component, which are in these models, are the um, terms to account for site effects. So um, low velocity layers in the, in the near surface um, underneath our instrument has a strong imp impact on strong um, ground shaking. So this is due to either the impedance contrast between the bedrock and the softer layers, and also resonance in those softer layers itself. So um, the, the layer will resonate at a particular um, frequency. We can also have in sedimentary basins surface waves generated at the edge, and they further increase that um, long period motions. Um, so because this is quite a common um, common observation and it's quite a well-known term we do have this in pretty much all ground motion prediction equations um, and just to show the importance of this factor again on the bottom we're, i'm showing the ratio between predicted spectral acceleration in on a soft soil site so with a vs30 of 200 meters per second against the rock um, sites a vs30 of a thousand meters per second so I just want to clarify what VS30 is there. So this is one of the sort of terminologies that people use. So this is what's the average shear wave velocity in that top 30 meters of uh, below the site. Um, so that's a key. Um, you can see that the amplification in this case is, is perhaps a factor of one to two at very short periods and perhaps a factor of three to seven long periods. Um, so this is a very strong influence, this um, site effects, and hence very important to include in any seismic hazard assessment. Um, so now I'm just going to show you some comparisons of a new ground motion prediction equation against an old one, to, just to show how things have evolved over the last um, 50 plus years. So first of all, we'll start with the original ground motion prediction equation, not called that at the time, um, called an attenuation relation um, from 1964. So you can see only three um, coefficients in this model. Um, and there was only 46 records used. And they just, as I said, regressed the data that they had available and um, defined these coefficients. One of the most recent um, models, which is um, commonly used, is this one here from Abrahamson and Silva. You can see how much more complex these models are now. Um, much more complicated functional form, many more free um, coefficients, and much larger um, databases available to define those coefficients. And there's much more care now taken to collect the data, to, to uh, process it, and to do regression techniques, which account for the various correlations between the, um, the, the inputs. Um, so generally, modern models are somewhere between the, these two. So perhaps using maybe 10 to 20 coefficients and using a couple of thousand records is quite standard these days to define the model. So now I'm going to get onto some of the challenges in using um, ground motion prediction equations. Um, so I'm going to start with a discussion of, of what's called aleatory variability and epistemic uncertainty. So to, to do this, I've, I'm plotting the data on this a diagram here from the Northridge 1994 earthquake in California. Um, so each of these dots was an actual strong motion record in this very um, famous earthquake. Um, and you can see um, distances from the full and peak, peak horizontal acceleration on the y-axis. So if we were driving a ground motion prediction equation just for this single earthquake, we could fit various functions through that. 
all of which are pretty much equally likely to be an appropriate model. So these are the colored lines in this image. So because we don't know which of those um, lines is the correct one, because there's quite a lot of scatter in the data, we don't have infinite amount of data from this earthquake, particularly very close to the earthquake source, we, we could have very different models, which all would e explain the data equally well. This is what's called epistemic uncertainty. So this is just that I um, considering the median prediction. So the prediction of the average ground shaking at a certain distance from this earthquake. If we also then um, do the difference between the, the curve itself and the data, we can, we can compute the residuals. So this is the difference between the recorded and the predicted from say the red curve in this example. So we can see there's a, uh, there's a significant scatter around that median. So we need to account for that if we're making a prediction in a future earthquake, what's the shaking. We don't wanna just consider the median, we also wanna consider that variability. Um, so epistemic uncertainty is handled through logic trees generally. So I'm gonna talk a bit about what I mean by that in a minute. And the aleatory variability um, is usually handled by what's called sigma. So this is the standard deviation um, of the, the fit to the, the data. So generally we assume a log normal um, distribution of the data, which has been shown to be a very good model for the data, at least up to three standard deviations from the mean. Um, so I'm gonna now talk a bit about these two, two aspects and the sort of challenges in their, in their use. So first of all, sigma. Um, so this is, a, just to repeat, this is the variability about the median. So in this figure here, we can see the, predict the, the actual measured um, standard deviations in each of these in number of GMPEs published since the 1970s. Um, so the sigma values reported by those um, developers. And what you can see from this is there hasn't been a a decrease really in sigma with, with time. So this plot stops in 2009 or 2008, but this is continued to the present day. This is not really a big, a, a big drop in sigma. So the question is, what is the correct value of sigma? Um, so you might think that the number, this won't have a very big impact, but it actually has a very strong impact on the um, results from PSHA. So if we um, consider this figure from a paper by um, Bomber and Abrahamson, 2006, um, and we consider, for example, an annual frequency of exceedance of 10 to the minus four. So this is a, in the UK in particular, this is a sort of standard um, frequency of exceedance or return period if we do one over that number um, we use for nuclear power plants. So if we had a GMPE which used a value of 0.19, so this is now in log to the base 10 sigma, we get a value of the PGA of 1G. If we then had one that was actually exactly the same, but just had a, a bigger sigma, we could have a factor of say 1.7 times bigger um, PGA. So obviously the question of which of these is the correct number has a very strong impact on the results of our PSHA calculation. So there's a lot of work um, on this sigma um, characteristic of GMPs. Now I'm just gonna show you an example of epistemic uncertainty. So similar to the previous plot, this is one where I'm plotting the predicted PGA from for a single scenario, so a magnitude six strike slip earthquake at 20 kilometers on a stuff, so stiff soil site. So what I did for here was I plotted the predictions from um, a couple of hundred GMPs published until 2010 with respect to time. And you can see um, there's a very large scatter in the, the predictions. So this is um, actual outputs from ground motion prediction equations. So if we, for example, use this model here, we get a prediction for this scenario of about 0.03. Um, if we use this one here, we'd get a factor of perhaps 20 times larger. So obviously that has great imp 
influence on the results of any engineering calculation using these GMPEs? Um, so which, the question is, which of these is the correct estimate of the, the medium PGA? So one way of um, trying to eliminate models which we don't think are appropriate. So we start with the um, couple of, well, 400, 600 models now in the literature. And we can apply like a, a checklist to say, um, to, 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 to winnow down those models to something a bit more um, manageable and concentrating on the, mo the, the best models. So first of all, we start off, for example, does the data set cover an ac accurate, accurate um, adequate range of magnitude distance? So if we're predicting um, ground shaking up to magnitude eight and our model only goes up to magnitude five, obviously that's not an appropriate model for our situation. So if we go through all of these steps, we can, we can reduce the number of models down greatly. So we did this in 2010. And we came down to about eight models, which we thought were um, appropriate for the project we were working on. Um, nowadays, there'd be a, a number of new models which might be considered. Um, and then the next thing what's generally done is, is to test the GMPs against the data that's available. So, if um, so, this is an example taken from a paper where I um, we were looking at the the shaking in the French Antilles in the Caribbean region um, from interest lab earthquakes. So these are deep earthquakes associated with the subduction zone. So we had quite a lot of strong motion data and we looked at various um, GMPs for subduction zones, uh, which are listed at the top. And when we came up with a ranking based on how well the, how good the residual plots are, which is shown an example shown at the bottom. Um, so the problem with this is quite a useful technique if you do have strong motion data, but generally the data that's available is actually from the smaller earthquakes or greater distances. So in this example, we might be interested in magnitudes up to maybe magnitude eight for this region, but most of the data is below magnitude 5.5. So we can get some um, some information from such analyses, but it shouldn't really be used blindly um, as we're not really testing the data for the data that we're most interested in. Um, so this is just to summarize the, the sort of procedure that we generally use for GMP um, selection. So we start with the literature, we apply some judgment, for example, that checklist shown earlier. We do some testing if there's any data available, and then we um, come up with maybe a handful of models which we think are appropriate for our um, seismic hazard assessment. And as Warren Buffett says, diversification is a protection against ignorance. Um, so he was talking about, you know, buying stocks and shares, but here we can use the same sort of argument. We don't know which of these models is the appropriate one, so we use a handful, a uh, selection of, of models which we think are, are reliable to come up with, to cover our um, epistemic uncertainty in which one of these is correct. And then we come up with weights for the different models um, and, and add them into our seismic hazard assessment. So this is an example from the SHARE European project. Um, where we came up with, we, we said these four models were an appropriate suite of models for our analysis, and we gave them weights based on the degree of belief in that model to be appropriate for the European active regions. Warren Buffett also said it makes little sense if you know what you're doing. So you shouldn't just use this uh, approach blindly, applying weights and hope that you um, sort of cover your back by um, selecting sufficient number of records. You, you should really co concentrate on the, record, the, the, the models which you selected um, and the weights that you apply to them. So just to show another example, so this is now um, an example of the sort of regionality in strong um, ground motions, which can have a, an in influence on the selection process and can, um, you know, it can cause difficulty. So um, I'm just going to show some examples from the Malise and Umbria Marque regions. So just indicating where these are on the map. So these are only a couple of hundred kilometers apart. 
Um, and there was ground motion prediction equations derived from data from these two regions um, following stronger sequences of earthquakes in those regions. So the solid lines of the Melise model and the dashed and dash dotted are the Umbria Marque models. Um, and you can see there's a, perhaps a factor of 10, a magnitude 4.5 in predicted ground motions from these models and a factor of five at 5.5. So obviously you have the question, is this just a sort of an event specific um, difference or is this actually a very strong regional difference between two different regions in Italy? If it's, if it's the latter, then it's difficult to then make predictions for areas where we don't have strong motion data. Um, Cause it could be, could be any of these models could be appropriate. Um, so, I'm now just going to show you the, the, the fact that this epistemic aleatory variability can't just be considered in um, separation. There's a, there's a trade-off between the two. So I'm going to consider this sort of fictive green blob of, a, of, of a, um, an island, for example, where we want to predict the, we want to get an estimate of the design PGA for a single a specific location. Um, so if we consider the epistemic and the aleatory variability, um, so one way of doing this would be just to do an average of all the GM, uh, all of the PGAs in the strong motion database, um, irrespective of magnitude, irrespective of distance. So then we have lots of aleatory variabilities because we have different magnitudes, different distances, which are adding to this variability. We have epistemic uncertainty because the database not be, might be not be representative of our of our fictive region. Um, you might think, well, I'll use a GMP, a simple GMP, which accounts for magnitude, distance, VS30, et cetera. Um, so then that aleatory variability disappears from the left-hand side, but it now appears on the ep epistemic side, and we have to integrate over all possible um, values. So this is basically a seismic hazard assessment. Then you might say you're going to use a more complicated GMPE. So for example, the NGA um, sequence series of modules, which are very complex. I showed an example earlier. So these account for more um, things on the left-hand side. So they disappear now, the exaliatory variability, but they appear on the right-hand side. Um, you can go, go even more complex or you can use simulations. So now they disappear from the left-hand side and they appear on the, on the right-hand side. So just to say there's no such thing as a free lunch, you basically, you can't just ignore epistemic uncertainty or ignore aleatory um, variability. You have to consider both. Um, so I'm realizing I'm a bit behind schedule, so I might just, move on a little bit quicker um, just to indicate um, we have pro a problem with the geographical spread of data so if i just show this example here um, most of, of europe doesn't actually have very much strong motion data at all so if we consider the uk for example very little um, data from um, uh, strong earthquakes so what do we do for such areas so this is one of the challenges which faces us um, to date. What, what do we do? Do we just develop, use models from elsewhere and hope that they're sufficient? Or do we derive um, bespoke models for our region? Um, so just to show that we can't really just wait um, for earthquakes to occur because um, earthquakes occur relatively um, rarely and hence we would have to wait for areas such as Spain, France, the UK, many hundreds, possibly thousands of years to actually have a, a, a suitable strong motion database to derive empirical ground motion prediction equations. So we either have to um, collect data from analysis regions, um, or we need to, and to create sort of multinational databases, or perhaps we use simulations or a bit of both. Um, to try to come up with um, models for those regions. Um, so now I'm just going to talk about the fact that multiple GMP approach is perhaps not always the best approach. So as I showed um, 
when we test the models, they only really that those results only really apply where we have lots of data. We don't really know. Um, we don't actually have a GMPE for our region. We don't actually have data. How do we um, account for that within a multiple GMP approach? Because none of the models which you select might be appropriate. Um, so we, there's a move in the last decade or so to a different way of, of um, developing ground motion models, which is called the backbone approach. So I'm just going to show you this now. So in the multiple GMP approach, we have three, for example, ground motion prediction equations. And we hope that that's a sufficient um, spread of um, uncertainty. But the, the way that backbone approach is, is we select um, works, is we select the, the most appropriate model, the one we think is the best, either in terms of its characteristics um, to the match to the, the region of interest, or it allows us to adjust it in a certain way to make it more applicable. And then we scale it up and scale it down by a factor, which could be magnitude distance dependent, but in the simplest approach, it's actually just a scale factor, a standard scale factor, which accounts for that uncertainty, that it's more of a judgment-based uncertainty in whether that's an appropriate model or not. So it has certain advantages in the terms of the transparency and the fact that we say what the uncertainty we're trying to capture is, the weights in the logic tree are what are called mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. So one of those models is correct. But we don't know which one. Um, in the multiple GMP approach, we, that, that MECE might not be, um, it might not be um, complied with. And we can also, because we're only using a single model, we can also make it, um, it's easier to make it model the model site specific for our problem. So I'm just going to show you an example now from the um, work of Bomber et al. for South Africa. So what they did was they selected actually three backbones for their problem. Um, and they then scaled it up by factors between 1.5 and 0.75 um, to count for the fact that they don't actually have any data from South Africa, but they, based on tectonic arguments, they think the, sh the shaking might be higher than average or lower than average, depending on whether it's a stable region. Well, it's, it's a stable region or um, extensional region. So you're, you're being very explicit about what the uncertainty is you're capturing rather than relying on multiple GMPs to, to, to capture that. So that's one of the growth areas, this backbone approach, which is being used quite a lot. Um, in recent recent work. So just to conclude now on the last sort of topic I want to talk about is what's called the move to non-ergodic models. So if we were doing in an ideal situation, we'd have the, the, the case here where we've got a single site um, and we've got lots of earthquakes recorded at that site. Then we derive a ground motion prediction equation um, for that specific site using all of those um, earthquakes. Obviously, this isn't a, um, a, a possibility because we would have to wait thousands of years to get sufficient number of earthquakes. So what we do in, in, is we use what's called the ergodic assumption and we replace time, the fact we don't have centuries of data, by space, by the fact we've got data from many different parts of the world, um, and we replace one by the other. So what we have is many sites, um, but only recording a few fewer earthquakes. And that's the ergodic assumption. So this allows us to develop models, but it, it's, it's not the same, um, it's not actually the, the true model of, our, um, of what we want to do in reality. So in the last decade or so, there's been a move to what's called um, trying to remove this ergodic assumption to account for regionality in that the median. So the example I showed earlier from Melise and Umbria Marque um, to remove the regionality due to repeatable site path and source effects potentially, and actually only using the part of the variability which is due to the um, different um, shaking at a particular site. Um, so we're not over inflating the sigma by 
grouping together um, the effects at multiple sites. And then we make an adjustment to the site we're interested in in particular. Um, so, as I said, lots of progress on this topic um, in the last decade. So just to um, show you as examples, there's been work in California where they've used the very rich strong motion database they now have to come up with coefficients of their ground motion models, which vary with um, spatially with uh, over the, the state. Um, and also work in the last year, um, developing a similar model for Europe, where you have repeatable site effects within your model and repeatable path effects um, in their model. So this is uh, uh, allowing us to come up with more um, better predictions of strong shaking in future earthquakes. And then just to conclude, we're, we're using um, simulations um, now for certain situations. So very large magnitudes, very close distances, um, perhaps areas where there's, where there's limited data. Um, so we're stable continental regions. So these are areas where simulations are very useful. Um, but it's still not routine. Um, and because we don't really know the correlations between the inputs to our simulations, you know, how stress drop correlated with rise time, correlated with fault length, et cetera. Um, and we don't have very detailed models of the Earth structure to allow these simulations to go to very high frequencies, very short periods. Um, so just to conclude, um, Ground motion models have been derived since the 1960s. There's dozens of models that are published every year. Um, so there's now 600 plus in the literature. So there's, there's a sort of in the last decade or so, there's some de facto standards which have been adopted um, to derive such models. They're improving all the time as more data becomes available. Um, but you still need to consider the, the median, the um, uncertainty in the median and the variability around that um, median. This is particularly true when you've got um, little data from your region. Um, and the epistemic uncertainty is often captured using logic trees. Um, but there's a move towards, um, as I said, the backbone approach, um, which has some advantages. Um, and then there's a move towards what are called non-ergodic models. OK, well, thanks very much. And there's some, uh, sorry, I ran on a little bit. So a couple of references. So these references, you should be able to find all the other references I refer to um, the, the full full details in these papers. OK, thanks very much. OK, so um, hope that was understandable. Um, OK. Thank you, John. It was, it was fantastic. And uh, it was really great to sort of hear the history and the different components um, okay. explained Thanks. Thanks. well to us. Um, at this point, I'd just like to ask if anyone has any questions, um, please either just turn on your microphones and your videos and ask directly, or if you would prefer to put them in the chat, I can obviously read them from the chat as well. Okay. Everybody's shy. No questions? John, where do you think the most progress is going to be made in the next five years or so? Because you talked about where a lot of current progress is being made. What's the sort of next big question? Uh, well, I think this non-ergodic models is the, you know, making the more region, region um, models. So, um, you know, in the past, it was using all the data from Europe and saying that's the model for Europe, which now we're seeing in the data, there's there's areas where the shaking's higher or shaking's lower um, or has different dependence on the magnitude, etc. So that there's a lot of progress in that area um, in the last decade, and they'll continue to be. Um, one of the issues is the fact that you need to know what's actually the signal and what's the noise. You know, is it just one strange earthquake or is it an actual true regional effect? Um, so with more and more data, we, we, should, um, we should sort of be able to answer that question. Um, and then the other thing I think is the, this move towards simulations. Um, and using those 
perhaps directly in um, seismic hazard assessment, which are not really commonly used or, or using them to maybe supplement areas where we don't actually have data. So, you know, very large earthquakes, you know, there's a handful of 7.5 plus earthquakes in the strong motion database using actually simulations of those um, to, 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 to constrain that part of the model. So there is some work already ongoing on that, but I think that's another area. Um, okay. Great, thank you. Does anyone else have any quick questions before we need to close? Oh, I have one um, from John Wardman. Um, he says, can you comment briefly on 3D ground motion simulations and how this ties in with GMPs, how they improve upon traditional practice? Yeah. Okay, so 3D simulations um, are, um, well, you have to sort of come up with a model of the, the velocities, a velocity model for your region. And then you, you um, put a fault in there and you simulate the rupture along the fault in terms of its um, slip and rise time, et cetera. And then the, the, the waves propagate from that um, through your region and you can do the simulation. So you could use those directly. So in some very high... Um, you know, high, uh, high value projects, um, nuclear power plants, etc. they might do that if they've got a fault close by that they have good characteristics for. Um, but I don't think they use the numbers directly. They maybe use them to compare with GMPEs, but you could actually use those, uh, those as data as actually like strong motion records, theoretical strong motion records that you could put into your ground motion model and actually use them as part of the regression to constrain that part of the curve. Um, so that has been done um, for, I think, subduction zone earthquakes that they've started doing that for, um, to, to, to really simulate those very large earthquakes, but they only have really the Tohoku earthquake and a, a couple of others with actually good strong motion data. They've started using those. Um, and, and there'll be a move towards using that in practice. But the problem is we don't know really these correlations between the inputs to the simulations. You can get what you want from the simulations, but to make it realistic, you really know, need to know what the sort of correlations are between these inputs. Um, I hope that answered Thank the you. question. Um, we've got one time for just one final question from Ricardo Caputo, um, who's got his hand up. Hi, Ricardo. Hi. And th thanks for the seminar. Um, do you think the next generation of uh, gram models, uh, gram motion models, could be forward modeling using uh, Monte Carlo or similar other statistical tools to make uh, many models from many possible uh, scenarios? So are you thinking about simulations again using? Or, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's theoretically entirely possible. Entirely based on simulation. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's possible, on. but I think, you know, the sort of practicing engineers who are going to use it for design or assessment, they've got more confidence still in the recordings themselves because they know that actually happened at somewhere in the world. Simulations, you know, sometimes the numbers look very high. They might be true for a particular you know particular fault but it's difficult to know whether that's true or not so there's still it's still you know i think there's a little bit of reluctance to move towards that approach but yeah it's it's, it's possible and and there are have been attempts to do it in the past um but whether they're going they've been used in practice i don't think so from my knowledge but it's definitely the way things will move but how quick it will move i I don't think it will move as fast as it could It could do, yeah. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, the answer is, I hope uh, they, they, will, they, will, uh, they will replace. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think future. empirical models have an advantage in the sense that, you know, we're using recordings of things that have actually happened. So in some sense, that's, that's a good ground, to, ground truth. But obviously simulations, you can have a much richer scenario. Um, you know, you can actually change the parameters and get a better understanding as well. So um, I think it will be the future, but 
perhaps not in the next five years, maybe the next 10 years. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sorry, I know there's a couple more questions, but uh, we have to close the meeting now. So um, if you do want to contact John, do or we can pick up maybe another time. Yeah. Um, John, thank you so much again. For okay. the talk. Sorry, I ran on a little bit. but um, No, not at all. Not okay. at all. It yeah. was uh, good to hear from you. Okay. Um, I'm sure the questions pose more questions, you know, yeah, every time yeah. you hear a question, people want yeah. to ask more. Um, but thank you so much. And thank you, everyone who joined us. And we will see you at the next one. OK, thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks very much. Um, a lot of the, um, the the questions I saw about the ranking there, you might want to look at the reference and it gives you the, the details in there. So, OK.